Okay. You can start. Okay. We ready? Right. Um, we're going to be, this is uh, part of my series of um, of presentations and uh, dealing with the social history of Ireland from antiquity to 1700 AD. Um, this one is, is called Resurgence of the Gale, which is about the Irish resurgence. Um, there was an English conquest in the 12th century, um, 12th to 13th century, that was quite successful, um, but it was incomplete. And um, and then uh, before, around about from 1542, the, the English start to get serious about Ireland again, but up in the interim, in the 14th, 15th centuries in particular, um, there is, there is a um, a complete um, the the control that the English had over Ireland uh, is lost, and uh, and the uh, and the Irish get get back at them. So um, I'm going to be explaining why all this happened and how it happened, and um, and 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 questioning uh, how how close. Uh, the Anglo-Norman uh, feudal society had, was becoming to the traditional Irish society, and we shall be exploring that as well. So, my name is Quivin Mukimisi, and I'm doing, and I'm now going to do the presentation. Just one one thing about this um, this this picture this picture behind. It's from a, a church in County Cavan, um, where the, this was, I think it's the 15th century. It was, um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a depiction of four martyred saints um, in a church. And it sort of conjures up the, 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 the general um, artistic styles of, Ireland in this in this period, uh, you can see. Uh, I think I think um, w w one of the saints being being martyred by a spear, and another one's being martyred by a sword, and and another one's being skinned alive. I think it's Saint Bartholomew or something like this. Um, and they're all carrying their their the um, the the means of their execution. Anyway, so. Um, we will we'll now move on from that to the next picture, which is uh, coming up now. Yep. So um, you probably recognize the picture on the, on the right. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this now. So from the end of the 13th century, um, the, uh, the later Middle Ages were to bring major challenges to the established order of Western Christendom, that's all across um, all across Europe, uh, a crisis that was ultimately to have enormous ramifications in the religious, political, social, and economic spheres. And no better illustration fits the turmoil of the times than the image on the right, which is the Four Horsemen by Albrecht Dürer, the famous German. Um, illustrator from the end of the 15th, uh, start of the 16th centuries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so the, the, um, the population of Europe had been expanding uh, throughout what's known as the Great Warm Period. The Great Warm Period um, of feudalism is roughly about from the 9th, 10th centuries um, on up until the, the, um, the start, the end of the 13th century. Um, and this was a period where it was very easy to grow crops. Um, the sun was, was the very, very warm summers, very easy to, to, grow, to grow, grow crops, which the feudal system was very dependent on because it was all to do with, with the, the peasants 
uh, surrendering some of their surplus to the lords who were uh, at least alleged to protect them um, from the uh, from other lords basically so it was a sort of extortion and racket really but um, but the the um, but but there was plenty to go around and enough to to um, to cause huge uh, population increase and a huge um, number of towns came up as well. And, um, and trade was flourishing um, in the uh, right up until the sort of, it reaches a peak round about the late 13th century and then, then things start to happen. Um, and there's there's uh, changing weather patterns. Um, so so I mean the, the, there's a lot of parallels with today, in fact. Um, and uh, pandemic, yeah, pandemic is on its way, and um, a big big one, like nothing, like COVID pales in comparison um, with what happened in in Europe. But, um, and the old feudal nobility are losing their monopoly on both wealth and violence. Now, this is very important. Um, the, the, their monopoly on, on violence was the fact that they were the only ones who were able to be fully armed and to, and to bear weapons in public and to um, also, um, you know, with with their armor, they were virtually invincible um, on on most battlefields. Uh, towards the end of the thirteenth century, people were starting to find ways of of dealing with them. You know, like shoot their horses or with arrows or or um, or overwhelm them in a in a swamp or something like this, um, which was which is sort of changing and then the foot soldiers started to become more important. And this is, this is um, so they were losing their monopoly on violence. They were also losing the monopoly on wealth. Um, this is quite important. Um, the, and in the initial, initial um, expansion of the um, artisan and merchant classes, um, a, a lot of it was within the Jewish community um and the of of europe at the time and and that was because the the um the 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 feudal nobility looked down on on um on on these on, on these occupations um and also because basically jews it was sort of like a semi apartheid thing so 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 jews were not allowed to 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 own land at all so 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 if if you were a wealthy um person of jewish extraction the only way you could you could um flaunt your wealth was by getting into something else and the only other thing to get into to make money at the time was was trade um and 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 money lending and things like this here and of course the the feudal nobility were becoming very um worried about uh, um about these things and they started stirring up and especially in england there was a terrible um they actually drove the jews out of out of england and they massacred quite a lot of them um uh you know it's an attempt by the by the old ruling class to to make sure that um that there was wasn't going to be a challenge to them of course it didn't work but but this is what they tried to do and the jews were a handy handy scapegoat of course not all traders were jews but um by any stretch of the imagination but um but but it, it was an easy scapegoat to um to jump on um so, so as I say, the, the, and the authority of the church, which had been pretty much uh, unchallenged. Um, there was a major challenge in the 13th century with the Cathar her heresy. We won't go into that, but, um, but apart from that, there was the, 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 the authority of the, of the Roman church in Western Europe was pretty much um, universal, um, but, 
from the 14th century onwards, you start to get groups like the Lollards in England. You start to get the, the beginnings of, I mean, we got the Hussites in, um, in what's now the Czech, Czech Republic. It was called Bohemia then. And, um, and they, 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 they um, are, are, are fairly strong in the, in the 15th century in particular. Um, and then there's there's also the the um, uh, then eventually that leads to a certain man called Martin Luther, um, and he and um, some, in in Germany, and then of course Calvin in Switzerland, uh, and they start off a, a new thing, but sort of round about the early 16th century, and that also ties into peasant revolts against. Um, Against against the landlords that had never really been seen on such an organized scale ever before. Um, so and um, wars um, were starting to erupt as the as the kings thought, sought to establish centralized state power in place of loose feudal ties of fealty and homage. Um, so these events would have an impact on Ireland too. Um, out in, as it was placed, as it always has been, I suppose, on the fringes of what was then Western Christendom. Um, by 1300, most of Ireland had been settled by Anglo, Anglo-Norman Anglo is, is the technical term. Um, they were Norman French speaking. Um, they, the aristocracy were, were Norman French speaking and a lot of the clergy were as well. Um, but the the um, but the but uh, they are called Anglo Normans because uh, in time they would f fuse with the English. But the English were at this point they they spoke a Germanic language, um, which would develop into the English language. But um, they were quite separate. They were sort of like a subordinated group of people even within England um, but you know so so this term Anglo-Norman is is debatable whether one should be using it or not but um, but it's it it to my mind uh, I think it's worth using but um, so so the, so the, the colonists came, mainly came from England, Wales and Flanders and they developed this vibrant economy um, in Ireland, um, in the places where they'd cleared the Irish out, um, or if they hadn't, there, there's questions as to whether they completely cleared the Irish out. They, they, um, they certainly had, had conquered quite a bit, which we'll see in the maps in a minute. Um, but uh, but the, and they'd established trade routes, they'd established towns, Lots of towns flourish in Ireland, lots of them still going today um, uh, with that, um, that were established during this Anglo-Norman period of, of settlement. And, um, and, the, the, um, and, and, and the quite a roaring agriculture um, going on as well. And the Norman uh, knights were, were, on, were at, at the top of it. And they were building castles and all sorts of things over Ireland as well. And English was spoken um, in quite a large proportion of Ireland uh, at this at this point. It was spoken in um, uh, well, in the we know that the, we we have we have records. There's there's a dialect from Wexford uh, which survived right up until the 19th century, which is based. Basically, it came from from medieval English, um, and um, and 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 that one was still going. And then there's um, and then the and English law as well. You know the the, the feudal law, basically the the, the um, law of William the Conqueror was being established everywhere. Um, we think that the Irish may have survived um, in in the in the um, in the norm in the Norman held areas as serfs um, because the the, um, the the typical feudal way of 
of conquering some um, a subordinated group um, was to try and drive them out or convert them. Um, the Irish couldn't easily be converted because they're already Christian. So, um, so you just basically tried to drive them out. Um, and, um, but they would probably be been allowed to, to, to remain if they took on serf status. So that would mean being tied to the land and being forced to surrender um, a large proportion of their, of their produce to the Lord. Um, whereas the English settlers would have predominantly been artisans, they would have been traders, they would have been um, what we might call yeoman farmers, who are sort of like free farmers, um, so peasants, but, but free peasants rather than um, uh, serf peasants. Um, but this was all to change, so we'll have the next picture. Right, here we go. So, so these two maps show um, Ireland uh, on, the, on, the, on the left, that's Ireland around about 1300. Um, and then you see Ireland over on the right, it's about 1500. And um, the, the land held by the Normans is in a sort of goldy yellow color on, on the left. And the land still held by the native Irish uh, predominantly in Ulster and a few scattered spots elsewhere um, is, is what was left to the native Irish. Basically parts of Ireland that were either not worth the Normans conquering or they, they couldn't get in there without being ambushed in the, in the woods or something like this. So, um, so the the uh, and as you can see, you can see a lot of the of the uh, of the towns. So, some had already been established by the Vikings, but um, but many many of them are are uh, were established by the English. And th those, that's only some of the towns. That's only the big towns. So you've got lots of small towns as well, uh, like Athenry, for instance, which we'll be sh we'll be having a look at a map of that shortly. Um, now. And then, but by 1500, what, what you see is, um, is over, over on the right. Um, now, these are all, all the multicolored regions. This is a resurgent Irish comeback. Um, and you can see that the, the, the Irish clans, which are the small multicolored little areas, that, that, mean, that means that they had re-establish themselves in these areas. Um, some of them were quite important, like Chiron and Tuchonel in the, in the north, um, uh, but um, a lot of them were just quite, quite small ones. Um, on, over, over on the, the white areas show what was technically, tech, I say technically, um, uh, still under Anglo-Norman control. In reality, the only area under Anglo-Norman control was the Pale. If you look, look on the far right around where Dublin is today, well, it was there at the time as well, but um, the, the Pale roughly corresponds to, it's about twice the size of the area of um, County Dublin today. So it's it was um, sort of like County Dublin plus um, a few more areas, um, and um, and that was basically the only area by 1500 where English law and English language ruled supreme. In the rest of the white er areas, which are supposedly under Norman control, they're actually run. They're being run by Anglo-Norman lords, but these are high. Um, uh, Anglo-Norman lords who've gone native, so they they're speaking Irish. Um, most of the time, they can speak English. They they owe some sort of fealty to the King of England, but but only in a very loose and um, and not very um, you know. And, and they basically do what they want. Um, and they and they are and they're marrying Irish wives, and they ha um, and they're 
they're even allowing the Irish laws to to to, to apply there as well. So so um, so you can see there's been quite a big change there. Um, uh, in in you know you've gone the Irish have dropped for, um, have gone increased from a control from about a quarter of the island to near three quarters of the island. So um, and, and even more if you include the the um, the uh, what you might call the um, the 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 English settler areas which had basically gone native. All right. Um, so the the um, so the but if we have a look at the what picture on the on the on the on the left there. So so we have the picture of Ireland with thirteen hundred. Now a Parliament of Ireland had even been established in twelve ninety seven, um, and England in, in England ruled Ireland. Not England wanted to rule Ireland as part of its kingdom right from the start, but. Uh, but they had problems with the popes of getting this through, um, and and the so so they eventually settled on what's known as the, the lordship of Ireland. We, we did a bit of this in the last episode, um, which was a sort of halfway house where the the um, the the popes wouldn't wouldn't um, commit to allowing. England to annex Ireland and turn it into part of part of England, but they would, um, you know, like under the English crown, um, but they but they would uh, grant it as a lordship. So so the so the so the um, so the there was a local um, administrator uh, who worked for the English king. Um, and he was called the well. He was called different things at different times, but we're going to call him the just the just the car, um, which is he. He was the 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 sort of um, the the king's stand-in in in Ireland. But he but he had to have this distance. He couldn't rule Ireland directly. He had to have his his. His stand-in, who was um, supposed to take fealty from the Anglo-Irish lords and so on and so forth, um, and um, and this this situation carried on right up to um, around about 1530, where you got, um, and as I say, even by that point, even even within the Pale um, or in the borders of the Pale, <laughs> um, there was there was. The Irish were making inroads even there, and um, and the uh, and the and the current Justicar of Ireland in um, in in um, in fifteen thirty thirty one. He was a he he was a, a guy called Silken Thomas Fitzgerald, and um, he was he was Fitz. Fitz being a Norman name, uh, so he's a Norman descent, but he pretty much spoke Irish and he was constantly scheming with the enemies of Henry VIII in England um, to overthrow him. And, um, and he basically been giving two fingers up to Henry VIII for a long time. Uh, but in 1531, um, uh, it, the Henry VIII had him arrested and um, and then executed him and several of his mates, and that uh, and that put an end end to him. But um, and from that point onwards, from 1542, um, Henry VIII passes the the Lordship of Ireland Act, which um, or, or rather the Kingship of Ireland. The, Kingship of Ireland Act, where he actually says, "I'm now king, king of Ireland," and he's helped by that with the Reformation because he doesn't have to go to the popes anymore. He just says, "I'm I'm king of you now," and you you just have to put up with it. Um, so so that's what happens in 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 1542. Um, okay, we can go on to the to the next picture. Right?
Right, this, this is um, a couple of pictures here. Um, I think one's more famous than the other one. Um, but um, st starting in the late 13th century, our, Europe had emerged out of a warm, stable, climactic period that brought um, unprecedented growth to the economy and population. We've, we've already been talking about that. Uh, into the beginnings of what has been termed the mini ice age. And this lasted right on up until the, about the middle of the 19th century. Uh, this period was inaugurated by extreme weather events, uh, including recurring and severe storms, floods, freeze overs, and even once it settled down, you know, you, this period roughly lasted about 50 years, 50, 60 years, something like that. And then it sort of just became um, normal cold, but normal but cold. Um, but, but, but the the climate was less fa favorable to sustaining the economic power of the former feudal elites and the church. And in Ireland, we have records of the, the hardships that the onset of these extreme weather events produced, mainly from colonists. Uh, for example, the city of Dublin experienced famine on and off uh, between 1297 and 1331. Um, and uh, in the winter of 1338 to 39, the River Liffey, which is, which is the main river which Dublin is built around, um, it froze over. I mean, this, you, you'd never have this happen now. Um, it froze over so hard that people could go down onto the River at Liffey and light fires, bon, bonfires. They had a sort of festival on, on, the, on the ice um, and they were lighting fires on the, on the ice and without it melting. Um, so, so that was that was quite um, that was quite some winter that one, and of course th this meant that people's food stocks were running running out. Uh, th there was another occasion, I think in I think the winter of 1330-31, again in Dublin, the um, the the the, the there's near starvation in fact, and the um, there was only saved when a school of whales beached themselves, unfortunately for the whales, uh, in, in the vicinity of, of Dublin city and, and the locals were able to go out and finish the whales off presumably and then they chopped them up for, for food. So anyway, um, that's, that's, that's basically that. You, you can see this picture with this guy who's having the, the rains coming down and putting out his fire. And then you've got the ice and snow and all the rest of it over, over on the other side. Okay, so um, we can probably move on to the next one now. Yeah, so, so this one's quite funny, I think. Um, so this this is um, uh, this is ha this is um, it's a rather wild picture. Um, it's a medieval painting. It sums up the terrors um, that the clergy and so on were imagining could take place in the context of a famine or crop failure. Um, the um, a recurrent theme in the records is this sort of fasc fascinated hor horror with any alleged instance of cannibalism, um, which to my mind, um, it reflects in the irrational fear. It's sort of like, you know, the, there's, there was a recent movie called, um, uh, was it World War Z or something like this? It was really awful film with Brad Pitt in it. And um, and and the and the zombies, of course, are the are the are the are sort of cannibalistic again, and they're and they're a bit like the, the sort of the the fear of the of the other, you know, the 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 unwashed masses, and 
and the and the unwashed masses are in in the are, um, quite quite um, uh, revealingly are are you know the the state of Israel is under attack, and the state of Israel has got all its walls around it, and and you can see all these hordes of zombies coming from what presumably must be Arab areas. <laughs> And they're and they're storming and they're trying to storm over the wall into into, into Israel. So so it must be a, must have been a little bit like that. So so it was it, it, it's sort of like this irrational fear of the other of the of the people whom you have been dispossessing, the people you have been um, taking their labor you, the, the, from the, the the people whom you. Um, are um, are basically living on the backs of and and you and if you can imagine it you know the, the people people having these these morbid uh, morbid Im imaginations you know like during a time of famine you 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 go out you're a clergyman or a noble or whatever and you're stepping over um, a dead body on the street and you're thinking you, you guilty feelings I would imagine as well will be part of it and they'll be thinking um well uh you know could could this um you know what would happen if if the people rose up against us would would we be first on the menu uh, <laughs> um and and I think this this picture sort of sums it up anyway I'll move on from that um, however, in the last quarter of the 13th, 14th, uh, and the first half of the 14th centuries, uh, there is a very real series of agrarian disasters, um, I mean, the, the quite serious ones, uh, produced by the cl changing climate and the catastrophic extreme weather events in 1315 to 18, which is the, known as the Great Famine. Um, it alone reduced Europe's population by an estimated 10 to 15 percent, which is quite quite a lot. Um, and um, in Ireland, both settlers and natives were suffering from this. But the impact, I would argue, on the far more complex settler economy was greater. So we can move on to the next picture. Yes, so now we've got the pestilence, the plague, the Black Death. Um, so, so the the um, the uh, the Black Death had reached Europe in 1346, and it didn't fully abate until 1353. Um, its main period was 1347 to 1351, but. Um, but it, it, it carried on and in fact, it, it came back, um, it kept on coming back right up until more or less about the, the 18th century. Um, it was still coming back every now and again, less so every as years went on, but it still kept on coming back. Um, and this, the, the pandemic in the middle of the of the 14th century had a huge impact and just unbelievable. Um, they reckon it reduced the population by 35 to 50 percent um, in most areas, not all areas, some areas, especially areas which didn't have a lot of trade going on or whatever, uh, they managed to escape it, but or not escape most of it. But um, but 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 uh, in 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 other areas it was like serious. Um, as a result, many towns were abandoned and huge tracts of land were, were reverted to nature. Uh, Labour was also in short supply, so which actually helped the peasants um, or the the now the the workers, the the peasants, because because peasants had to. Had to, had to move to the towns to, to get, um, in order to, to get work. But when they went to the towns, they found that um, they, they could get, they could ask or, or demand um, higher wages. So, uh, so, so this was, um, this was also something that the, that the rulers were very, um, were very worried about that, um, 
that the that the lower classes were were, were going to be able to um, get the the full um, the full whack for for what they were putting in. Um, in Ireland, the plague um, disproportionately hit the English colonists. Um, as you might expect, because they were living in towns, they had constant, concentrated nuclear villages and very busy trade routes. So that was a, that was a, like a gift horse for, for the plague. Um, so the plague just went sweeping through these settlements and um, probably reduced them about 50% in population. That would have, and then um, you know, and some towns would have been abandoned and so on and so forth. Some villages would have been abandoned. Um, and, but the native Irish, however, were, were um, there was this, this sort of apartheid going on in Ireland as well. So, the, so they weren't really mixing. The, the Irish and the English were not, were not mixing very much. At this stage, they were a lot later on, but not, not right now. Um, and the um, and they had a more dispersed settlement pattern. You know, Irish homestead here and a homestead there and a homestead somewhere else. And um, the, but um, not no 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 great concentrations of people. Um, and the and they had a much reduced level of trade, so they escaped the worst. Um, and Okay, so we'll dealt with the plague. We can probably move on to the next one. Right, and this is the so this is another horseman of the apocalypse we're dealing with now. This is war. So um, the the um, as well as as famine and pestilence, uh, the period saw a huge upsurge in war. Um, now, when I say a huge upsurge in war, war had been fought before, but, um, you know, the Crusades, you know, and the re Reconquista of Spain, um, but, but these were, or in the East as well, the Teutonic Knights were trying to gobble up um, the Baltic states and Russia um, and Poland, and, um, but, so, so there were definitely wars, but these are wars in, uh, 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 against the infidel. This is wars against non-believers. Um, sometimes the non-believers include Orthodox. So, so um, the one of the Crusades, um, when they couldn't get to the Holy Land, they decided, oh, well, we'll sack, we'll sack Byzantium instead, um, which was. Uh, <laughs> Which is bending the rules a little bit, um, but but they, so they so they conquered most of Greece in this period, um, and they call it the Latin Kingdom, I think. Uh, but anyway, that that's that, that's but but th this was on the fringes. It was never and outside Christendom. This was always certainly certainly Catholic Catholic Christendom. Um, this is where the wars. The, you know, like the proper wars were being fought it, within within the kingdoms, the wars in the 12th, 13th, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries were generally um, over honor and fealty and things like this here. And basically an, an, um, a king would assemble or a magnate, you know, could be a duke or something. He has this dispute with the king. He brings along a whole, uh, like a hundred knights to battlefield and, the king brings three hundred knights, and maybe the maybe the uh, the the um, the duke has a, an ally, and that's another hundred knights or something like this. And and, and they have a basically a glorified tournament. Um, it's not really a battle as such. Um, there, in fact, there were in the 12th, 13th centuries, there were more more knights killed in. In you know in these internal Christendom wars, um, so-called wars, the, the more more knights were killed um, in real tournaments than they were <laughs> in real battles. So so that's sort of giving you an idea. Uh, and 
the, the there there was um so so the, the, there's all this sort of uh, the chivalric code and you know you're supposed to make your enemy yield and then hold him for ransom and all this sort of stuff um but as the no holds barred uh, means to increase the territories of belligerent royal states now this is what was beginning to replace um the old feudal system uh by the by the by the end of the 13th century so so you have these belligerent royal states that are trying to centralize and uh, uh absolute power in in the monarchy very slowly to begin with but but they but they build up um pace and by the start of the 16th century for instance england and france in particular have and spain have have pretty much um they have very and portugal they have a very strong centralized states where the local magnates the dukes and counts and so on don't dare do an, anything or else they'll be they'll be um have their heads chopped off sort of thing um and um and the english crown was becoming involved increasingly involved in its all-consuming attempts to conquer scotland um the edward the first tried it was trying in scotland uh and then edward the third went over from england to france and he tried to conquer france basically um and um the causing the hundred years war which dragged on for about a hundred years and the um and it had huge impact in 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 europe and um and but it meant ireland was 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 suddenly not not being attacked anymore so so it, it sort of sank on the list of royal priorities except as a means to provide provisions and troops for the conflicts because the settlers were still were were being asked you know to or you, you know give us give us some victuals for for um for sending off to to um you know for for our armies in in France or in Scotland or whatever and 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 the locals who were left you know after the plague and after the the famine they were thinking well you know now you're asking me as well for for all my cattle to to feed feed the army and you know i'm not really happy with this maybe i should make friends with my irish neighbors and uh and uh maybe uh stop paying this 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 stupid tax um so the the respite also allowed native irish chieftains to reorganize their military forces because they uh, the irish had pretty much they 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 they'd just been fighting with spears and mainly on foot um no armor or little armor and uh no organized uh, well, well what 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 um we would call organized military forces at all um they they, they suddenly started to, to reorganize this so that they could match the so far winning english combination of men-at-arms and archers and men-at-arms being knights and their hangers on um and your know, squires and and um and and mercenaries there was a big group big increase in the number of mercenaries not uh, and the fewer and fewer knights actual knights um because being being a knight it costs a hell of a lot of money but especially by the 14th century you had to buy we had to um get get hold of so much gear and you had to go on to, and uh, attend all these different events and all the rest of it and a lot of people just said well I'll just, you know, I've got, I've got the weapons, I've got, the, I've got the gear. I'll just go. I'm not going to go for the knighthood, but I'll, I'll become a man at arms. So, anyway, okay, we can move on to the next one. Yeah. So this is the. We'll now speak a little bit about the um, campaigns of Edward Bruce, 
Now, Edward Bruce is the brother, younger brother of um, Robert Bruce. You've probably heard of Robert Bruce. Uh, Robert Bruce was the King of Scotland who drove the the English out of out of um, out of Scotland in the in the uh, start of the 14th century. And he just won a battle in Bannockburn in Scotland, and he de completely defeated the English army. English army ran. Um, Edward II um, abandoned all his all his um, court court possessions. His his royal throne was left behind, um, and um, and the. A lot of English were killed, of course, and a lot of them were captured, and ransomed. Uh, but the the um, there was a but the but the English wouldn't 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 give up. So they they kept on trying to to uh, reestablish the situation, even though they 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 basically been defeated. Um, and the um, and the 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 Scots. Uh, had links to Ireland because Scots actually, the Scottish royal family originally come from Ireland, and um, Edward Bruce's mother was was of Gaelic descent. When Gaelic Western Isles of Scotland, who were related to the Irish very closely, and um, so so he he, he uh, Ro Ro Robert thought, well, if I just send my younger brother over, I will make him king of Ireland. And then he can he can champion the Irish cause there, and he can drive the English English out, and that'll that'll teach them a lesson, and maybe they'll come to terms and they'll accept my peace offer. So um, so he 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 did that. He gave he gave um, Edward uh, some forces who went over to Ireland, and then there was a period, and it coincided with the famine. The, this great famine of 1315 to 18 uh, went over there and R R Robert Bruce actually joined him for one of his campaigns but they basically ransacked the whole island um, it was it started off as a sort of liberation war and ended up as a plundering war because everybody's running out of food as I've already explained um, and um, and the armies just decided you know that they needed victuals and peasants had these victuals we're going to take it off them no matter whether they're Irish or or um, or English or whatever they are um, and so so he fought this rather pointless you know it was a quite brilliant campaign at the start um, the ultimately pointless campaign which um, devastated quite large regions of Ireland um, mainly in the Norman areas, but not entirely. Uh, and you can see that this is this campaign of 1317, I think is the, uh, which shown. Uh, in 1318, he was defeated at Fochart in County Louth. Um, and th this is Edward was defeated and he was killed and the Scots were decisively defeated by a combined force of English with Irish allies. Um, and, um, and, they, and that was the end of that basically. So that was the end of uh, Edward Bruce's attempt to be the King of Ireland. It, it's a quite an interesting speculation point as to what might've happened if, if he had succeeded, it would have been interesting. Uh, but um, he didn't, so, and he was killed in, in battle, and that was the end of it. Robert, his brother Robert, gave up after that, and eventually they came to terms, terms with the English and agreed a truce. Okay, we can have the next one. Yes, yeah, so, so these are the sort of typical Irish warriors. Um, th these are the are the gallo glasses now? The gallo glasses were um, they were um, Ireland's first answer to the to the um, or uh, to the 
to the sort of tactics the Normans have brought in with, with the heavy armoured men on horseback and the archers. Um, so the the Irish have three types of soldiers. See the the, the kern, where you can see a kern is in the in the picture on the left at the bottom. He, he's um, he, he's got a mullet, a, a haircut, as you can see. Um, a lot of them seem to have had these mullet haircuts. Uh, he, he's basically from from the from the old peasant levy, sort of the um, every free man sort of idea. And he's holding a spear. And then, but but the big guy um, in the foreground, he's he's uh, he's a galaglass. He is um, heavily armoured or relatively heavily armoured. Um, maybe not quite as heavily armoured as a knight, but he's getting on that way. And he's got and he's got big swords and he's got uh, a big axe. And uh, he, they often have spears and bows and all sorts of stuff. But um, but they were from the Western Isles of Scotland um, and they were recruited as mercenaries and they were being settled. Um, they were being paid for by the Anglo or by the native Irish lords who brought them over from Scotland and, and gave them land in, in, um, in return for, for service um, in, in, a, in a mercenary manner. And they were extremely tough fighters, uh, quite cruel, I think, a lot of them. And um, and very, and they were chosen for their size and their and their fearlessness. So um, so they were able to stand up to the to the um, English combination of knights and archers. Um, the first first Irish soldiers that were able to do that. The picture on the right is sort of a bit like that. That there's a guy with a um, or it might be a woman, I'm not entirely sure, with, a, um, with bagpipes and a dagger of some kind and a, um, a long, long version of the Lena, which is the Irish tunic. Um, and, and then you've got somebody else on the, on the right there who's got a bit of, a bit of knightly armour and um, he's waving a spear with a big sword. Okay. So, so that's, um, there were two other f forms I've already mentioned. Well, there was the, there was the Galglass, there was the Kern, which is the basically unarmored guy just runs around and chucks spears at people and maybe jumps on their back in the middle of a bog and hits them over the head with a club or whatever. Um, and then there's the Hobbler. The Hobblers were more famous in, in, in the Hundred Years' War, because they were recruited by the English um, as scouts, so they they were sort of, but they were horsemen. Um, they rode a special type of pony, which you get in Ireland. Um, it was known as the hobby, and um, it was it was a, like a very light light horse, which could um, run over rough ground very easily, and. Um, and was very suited for raiding um, and this sort of stuff, but not for standing up in in uh, to fighting in in big battles. Uh, but 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 very good for for scouting and 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 um, and for raiding these these sort of uh, tactics, which were the Tom dominant Irish tactic which they would use. Okay, so we can move on to the next one. Right, this is, you, we've got some more soldiers here. It's very difficult to get a hold of pictures that don't have soldiers in them from this, uh, from these times. Um, it seems that everybody's fascinated with our soldiers, uh, but not with um, our civilians so much. However, we do have a couple of, We've got um, a couple of women here who are dressed in um, in what we assume would have been would would have been the the um, the, the, the clothes of the 
of the time. And then, then we have um, a, a little boy who's uh, playing the bagpipes and, and you've got a, a, a guy of the Wild Irish Man. The Wild Irish Man is, is a Kern again, which is one of the soldiers which I've been talking about, the sort of the peasant soldiers it were. Um, and he, he's got a sort of plied type thing thrown o- over him and or brat they call it in Ireland. Um, and um, and um, and then there are a couple more people over over on the on on the left there, armed guys. Now these might be um, native Irish because the the, the gallo glasses, which I was talking about, they had local imitators um, and who were who were who were Irish, but they were. Um, so imitated the Galagrasses. They weren't quite as good as the Galagrasses, but they sort of imitated them. And they, they again made mercenary service. So, so they were billeted on the, on the, on the peasants, uh, generally speaking, um, as, as soldiers, which is what the term Bonacht means, because the, the Bonacht was the, was, the, was the system by which the Lord could farm out his his um, professional soldiers to be billeted on his on his tenants. Okay, so we move on to the next one. Yeah, so so this is now um, we're now dealing with uh, contrasting the types of settlements that you have. So. Um, so the typical Ang- late Anglo-Norman settlement, as it might appear in the Pale, we've been talking about the Pale, um, is on the left. So you can see concentrated villages, you, you know, got, you, you've got the Romanesque church, you've got the Mott and Bailey castle in the background, you've got a, um, a uh, manor house of some kind as well, and you've got a windmill and, and you've probably got uh, a, uh, you know, a pub of some kind and um, and you've got a marketplace and all these sorts of things and and, um, and m- a lot of movement on on the rivers lots of boats going up and down and and uh, uh, berthing up at the at the at the, um, at the settlement and of course this is this is how the the plague and so on and so forth spread so quickly. Um, on the right, you can see what the native Irish or, or, or Gales were settling. Some it was much more like. So that 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 is a probably quite a um, wealthy peasant household. So um, there's a group of people in front. I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but um, it could be some sort of procession or religious thing. Not not entirely sure, but but the um, uh, as you can see, the Irish houses are changing in style. The Irish houses before were round mostly. They, they're now changing to a sort of oblong shape. So they're actually quite similar to, to, the, to the feudal houses over there uh, on, the, on the left. In, but in terms of settlement areas, you know, the, the Irish are tending to be much more dispersed. You can see that this this house is in the foreground. You've got another couple of houses on the on the hill over there on the other side, and, and so and so on and so forth like that. It would be very very dispersed um, settlement settlement patterns, um, and so the the um, so we can prob- probably uh, move on to the next one. Next picture. Yeah, so this is uh, Carrick Fergus. Um, I think we had a picture of the earlier form of Carrick Fergus in the last um, in the last presentation. Um, uh, this is it. It's expanding now. So you've got um, so you've got a um, a town is growing outside Carrick Fergus. Carrick Fergus is in County Antrim, uh, which is in the north of Ireland and um, the northeast coast of Ireland. And, and this, this place actually remained pretty much under control of the English crown, this, this town, um, right up until um, 
until Henry VIII, um, if not later. Um, and uh, the the um, uh, and as you can see, you can see a, that there's an, an abbey there, and then there's a, um, a sort of new Gothic style um, church on the on the on cathedral, probably on the on the on the right. And you've got a whole lot of ships um, in the harbour, uh, bringing trade into Ireland or, or alternatively taking it out. Uh, um, okay, we can move on to the next one. Yeah, so this is the this is this uh, city of or a town of Athenry. Now this is more much more like one of the smaller towns which you would have had. Set, uh, settler towns, which you had in Ireland. Um, in, this is in County Galway, and um, and as you can see, there's the 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 actual what what I find fascinating about medieval towns is that um, is that there's very little houses in the inside them. That well, 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 there are, but but the um, but there's but there's much more green space. Then, then that's within the city walls. Um, so, so it's quite interesting that it, it, it's basically because everybody was was still supporting themselves. Um, you know, e even if you were, um, I mean, if you were a commoner of any description or a serf or whatever, you would um, you, you wouldn't be a serf in a, in a city, but or, or town, but you would. Uh, you know, everybody would have their own plot of land, so everybody would have their own allotment or whatever. Um, and um, the the uh, so there's there's Athenry Castle in in the background. Then there's a Dominican Priory, and so on and so forth. So um, and you've got these walls around, enclosing enclosing it, making everybody supposedly feel safe. Um, right down at the very bottom there, you've got what's known as a Gaelic ring fort. Now this is the old, this is the old style Gaelic ring, ring fort. And as I say, ring fort is really the wrong word. It's just an enclosed farmstead really. Uh, but they've acquired this name ring fort, which doesn't really sum it up at all. But, um, but it, it, it's sort of it's it's no better than an enclosed farmstead or a kraal, even you know, like in Africa. Um, and the um, but this was this was up until this period. This was the typical Irish farmer settlement in um, in Ireland. So it's like a big extended family would be living in one of these things. Uh, they would have a big roundhouse back in those days, but. By this time, people were adopting the same oblong-shaped um, houses, which the which the Anglo-Normans uh, and the Vikings had brought with them. Okay, next one. Next, yeah. Um, so this is this is uh, Kilkenny. Now, Kilkenny was was probably. A rival city to to Dublin. It was pro it was possibly even bigger than Dublin, you know, in the terms of the number of people in it. Um, and they had uh, they had a cathedral and they had an abbey and and they had a castle and they had everything. They had big big extensive walls um, and um, and the uh, and Kilkenny was actually more often used as the seat of the Irish parliament, um, you know, the settler parliament, basically. Um, it, was, it, was, it was more often used as the, as the seat of, of, the, of the parliament rather than even Dublin. Um, you know, they, they sort of tried to alternate it, but Kilkenny usually won the toss on that one. Um, and then over on the, on the right, the bottom there, you've got, um, I think there it's it's a pottery kiln, um, you know. So, so uh, on the outskirts of of Kilkenny, so you can see Kilkenny in the background, and all, all the, this group of local potters, who would be again, they would probably be settlers, and they'd be um, they'd be making um, the the pottery to be to be um, sold in the in the city. Okay. 
Um, we can move on to the next picture. And this is the Liberties in Dublin. Um, Liberties doesn't look like that anymore. Um, but if you can see far, far off in the, in the distance on the, on the right at the top, that, that's the actual River Liffey. Um, and uh, the, the um, town walls have shown up and the, and the, um, and the, and the, and the Abbey and the, the, um, and the, and the main streets um, of what was then Dublin. Uh, as I say, in that time, Dublin was overwhelmingly a settler town. It was like English people would have been living there. Um, that was to change later, but at, the, uh, at this time it was overwhelmingly in, in people of English settler des descent anyway, um, uh, except in a place called Oxmantown, which is right out to the to the um, south south uh, west of Dublin, where where is this is where they kicked all the Vikings out to um, because the Vikings had originally been a Viking town and the English kicked them all out to Oxman's town, um, which means Ostman's town originally, um, which is the which is what the Vikings were known as. Um, they were known as the Eastmen or the Ostmen. Um, and, and they were unceremoniously dumped outside the city walls um and in a in in a time of their own okay we can move on to the next one yeah so this is dundrum in in um in county down again in the north um so this is this is sort of getting closer to what the native irish are living in it's not quite the same because this is an actual Anglo-Irish um, settlement, but um, but the you can start to see that there's a bit of hy hybridity going on here. Um, you've got a sort of shell keep structure at the top, um, which would have originally been a Mott and Bailey castle, where you can see the sort of basic idea of the Mott and Bailey, which has been um, transformed into something a bit more permanent um, and then and then you can see some of the houses that are especially the ones outside uh, some of them are, are sort of roundy shaped so um, that could indicate um, that, uh, that, that the this is you know where some native Irish people are starting to move back in um, so anyway, that's 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 Dundrum uh, Castle in in County Down. Right, we'll have the next picture. Yeah, so these are uh, these type of how the um, houses, well, they or towers or whatever they're they're called as tower house. Now this is this is going into native Irish now because you've got the native Irish is starting to emulate in many ways the um, characteristics of the uh, of the Anglo-Normans um, so this this house you think oh it's a castle well it is but it's no, not quite a castle it's um, it's bears some sort of resemblance there are similar sort of tower houses being built on the Scottish border, on both sides of the Scottish border, on the English side and on the Scottish side, um, by local chieftains or lords there um, to, as a sort of fortified manor house type thing. Uh, and and this, is, this is the Irish equivalent. So it's got many, many um, medieval features to it um very similar to a, a castle in fact a lot of them are called castles um in in ireland today because a lot of these still stand um they stand in um in 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 western ireland in particular in southern ireland 
as well. Um, scattered everywhere else though as well. There's, there's quite a few of them in, in the north as well. But, but these, um, uh, these the, the, these type of structures, you can see that they, you know, there's spiral staircases and they have the battlements um, and, and there's, um, the, some of them don't have these enclosed walls around them. Some of them didn't, um, went wealthy enough, didn't command enough labor to, to be able to, to, to manage to, to build anything like this. Uh, but the enclosed area, it, with, with this one is called the Bourne, and the um, the whiteness of the tower is quite. The, this was something the English said. They they said you can always spot the Irish uh, where where the Irish um, chieftains are hanging out because they have these white towers, um, which was lime wash, which they which they threw over the walls um, in order to give this. Sort of sheen, white, white, um, white finish to the to the whole whole thing, um, and um, you know, I mean, it, it would have been defensible a house like this. I mean, especially towards the the bottom of it, you can see it splays out a little bit. That was to prevent people from using battering rams. It was thicker there, um, so so therefore it would, um, but. If you were really determined, you could get into a place like this. You know, uh, it wouldn't be, or if you had a big enough force, you wouldn't bother defending something like this. But um, but in, in terms of holding off raiders or this sort of thing, which was most of the warfare going on, um, you know, this would be more than adequate to do so. Uh, you've got you've got crenellations where you can you can um, shoot arrows from, or later on where you can. Uh, hold, um, point guns out of, um, and so on and so forth. And you've got defenses around the um, around the entrance inside, so you can you can drop things or shoot at people from above um, while they're while they're milling about trying to deal with the internal doors. Um, and then, then on, on the bottom floor, you can see that the, 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 this is where the provisions would have been held and possibly the provisions for the entire community yeah, would have been held there, you know, because it would protect everybody um, if they're able to um, it would prevent them from losing everything when, when there was a raid going on. Uh, above that is, is a whole lot of... Um, uh, this is this is presumably where the servants and the um, soldiers uh, for defending it would be sleeping. Um, as you can see, they they just uh, get together, free to a bed, um, and there's no there's nothing to uh, block you off from the other people. So you have to be pretty. Uh, able to cope with snoring and so on and so forth. Um, and then the next, next layer up is, is a kitchen. Um, the, the kitchen, or a, a back one, back one. Haven't finished, haven't quite finished with that picture. Yeah, yeah. So you've got, um, so you've got a, a, a on the inter, on the, uh, on the sort of inside diagram, as I was saying, you have, you have, um, uh, it, th there's a kitchen, kitchen scene, and they're basically preparing food for, for the feast. The feast is on the top floor. Um, that's the, that's, that's, um, that's the dining room stroke lounge type place of the Lord and where he would entertain his guests and so on and so forth. Uh, and presumably the wider public actually, in fact, would have been invited along, you know, his, his tenants and so forth would have been invited along as well um, for certain, certain occasions. Um, and then the one in between those two floors, that's, that's the Lord's chamber. So that's where him and his wife and his, presumably his children would have been on that lair. They may have, may have had, um, small L-shaped rooms or whatever, 
Um, and then you've got the guard robes down the side, which is where all the, where people piss and shit basically. And it goes down and out into the, into the, into the bone, um, which is the, the um, enclosed area underneath. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just speak briefly about, about the changes in in Ireland's um, Irish society at the time. So so we were speaking about about what what the the Irish would have um, the, the Irish Irish culture was similar in some ways to to was certainly very similar to Anglo-Saxon. Uh, culture in some respects, but not very similar to Norman Norman culture. Um, the Irish Irish system was was quite diffuse. They they didn't have concentrated power. You know, the chieftains ro rose and fell like like um, you know they they one chieftain get powerful and then he collapse and then the next one get powerful and then he collapse and so on and so forth and they would never usually be able to ex expand control for very long um the their their power base where it was the, in the feudal system of course it was based on you know the peasants couldn't escape you they were serfs or at least initially they were serfs uh, later on it changed but um but they were but they were originally serfs so they couldn't escape you um, they were tied to the land. Um, that didn't happen hardly at all in Ireland. There was maybe 5% of the population could technically be called serfs of some kind or another, but, um, but, the, but the rest of the, of the population, the sort of vast bulk of the, of the, of the peasant population were um, they were were um, uh, what's the word? They were um, well. They were free at any point. They if if they didn't like a relationship they had with the lord, um, you know, it was important to have a relationship with the lord. But if you didn't like the relationship with your lord, you could you could go away somewhere, and you could you could um, you could set up shop with another another lord and um there's nothing your lord could do about it um so so i mean that that was one of the big things another big thing is that the english punish uh, legal system was built on punishment um whereas the irish legal system uh, right up until this point e even 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 to, to the this point i mean yeah, the, the they were starting to talk, um, introduce punishment a little bit, but um, it was based on rest on restitution. So, if you if you had an argument with your neighbour and you killed him or injured him, um, then 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 the the the, the 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 law people would be brought in, but they wouldn't wouldn't be punishing you they would, they would they would say well you know what you need to do is you you see you you say hurt this guy you've broken his arm or whatever you need to you need to pay um the 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 family because it was all done on kin um it wasn't an individual thing either so it was based on on the kin so so your kin um had to pay the, the person you broke the arms of um, kin had had to pay them a, a certain a certain amount of um, uh, victuals in one form or another. It was usually it was expressed in terms of cattle. Whether it was actually paid in cattle or not would depend. But um, but it was it was say you know what you know you, you, you broke my arm. That's worth half a half a cow or something like this. Um, and and then and then then your kin would have to have to pay for it, and your kin might not be very pleased with you. So so it sort of worked worked as a way of um, of ameliorating or preventing uh, in internal strife within 
within communities um, in, in, in quite an effective way, actually, and uh, much better than through punishment, um, in my opinion. Um, which, which, especially in, in medieval punishment, involved, you know, anything from prison to um, to uh, hands cut off and and uh, uh, ears cut off and you know all, all the horrible stuff. Um, and um, but but Irish society was changing. The the lords were more. Um, as I say, there, there, there was a continuation, but there was also the lords were getting uh, much more power than they'd ever had before. And this was largely because they've been able to hire all these uh, mercenaries. Um, the soldiers were increasingly mercenaries. So, so you know, if, if you've got a professional army behind you, you're, you're able to, to tell your tenants, your, 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 your rural peasants, what to do a lot, a lot. Easier, so so there was changes going on even in in our society. It was becoming more oppressive, and um, we we certainly get the impression that that the general peasant population is getting poorer and more dependent on the Lord than had ever been the case in the in the past. But they were still weren't serfs. So anyway, that's that's this picture. We're now moving on to the last picture, and then we'll wrap up. Last picture, please. Yeah. So this is um, to, to give you an idea of what some of these tower houses are like in the inside. That's Bunratty Castle, Great Hall um, on the left there. So you can, you, you've got a, a pretty good idea of what, um, of the opulence basically in, in that, that could be achieved um, in a place, like that, the, 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 that's the great hall where where he would where the lord would uh, entertain his his guests. Um, in the middle is um, a sketch of Waterford Cathedral. So um, so this is again in the in the Romanesque style. Um, the, there's a few Gothic stars uh, uh, architectural forms built in Ireland. In this period, because um, because the Gothic style never really reached Ireland uh, before before everybody's wiped out by the plague, <laughs> um, so the it's predominantly the Romanesque style for your medieval architecture in Ireland. And the final image is on the right. Just a little interesting note. Um, this is called a shield and a gig. Uh, Sheila and the Gig is, um, you see them on several medieval churches um, from this period, and um, it sort of looks pagan. It's, it's really weird. We have no idea what, what the purpose was. Maybe, maybe some people want to speculate afterwards, you know, what, what the purpose might have been. That would be quite interesting. Um, but they're, they're found on the exteriors of many Irish churches during this period. And um, as you can see, it shows, uh, it's, it's not quite clear what gender that person is, but um, apart from the, what, what, <laughs> what that, um, what the, the, uh, the, the or organ that's being held, held wide open is, but other ones that are, are obviously female breasts. So, um, so you've usually a breast, this one doesn't have breasts. Um, and then this, um, this ex uh, extended, extended vulva, um, you know, what is all that about? We don't know um, because Ireland was officially, it was Christian. Um, so, so why were these things being stuck up? So nobody knows. Um, you do find them not only in Ireland, you find them in, uh, across in, in, in a, a few of them, not that many, mostly in Celtic areas of, of, um, of Britain, but um, it's predominantly found in Ireland. Uh, anyway, that's, that's it, basically. So um, we, can, we can wrap up and we can start, uh, you can start launching launching 